everybody, it's Adam from Lucipixel and yes I've decided to take this into my backyard because it's a beautiful day and I've got a new MacBook so I wanted to take advantage and just nerd out with my new tech. <laughs> I'm just nerding out with my new tech. With that said, I got an email from one of my graduate students, somebody who graduated a while ago who's an amazing artist, who um, emailed me with a real issue that I feel a lot of us artists face. In fact, to be completely honest, a lot of the ideas that I get from my art talks are only, aren't only from my own experiences, but from a lot of the, a lot of the conversations that I have with my students, because they're the ones who hit, who very often uh, um, uh, come to me with these hard hitting questions, stuff that really, really matters in the industry, right? Uh, so to all of you, to all of my current and past students, I thank you very much for that. And in his email, he mentioned two very important things. Number one, he was working for a job that he wasn't particularly crazy about. The artwork that he was doing wasn't stuff he was really driven by. And the second thing was, uh, it was really, really pushing him hard. It was a very high demand, high volume job that was really pushing him hard. And I've been in both of those situations more than once, many times. So what he was asking me in the email was, how do I find motivation? How do I push forward? He said that he gets maybe two or three hours worth of good time in him and then after that he can't help but to move on to more brainless rendering work because he just doesn't have the drive in him to be creative and to be uh, uh, ambitious with his work because it's just stuff he just doesn't like that much and it's also burning him out. Okay, Number one is you have to take ownership of the work that you're doing. When we're in a position where we're not driven, where we're not connected emotionally to the work that we're doing, we're not, it's not work that, we're predict that, that inspires us, simply doing the work that is asked of us is not enough to find drive. It's like being asked to eat food you don't like eating, right? And I'm, I know we're outside, it's a bit breezy today, so hopefully it's not blowing against the mic. Simply doing the work that's asked of us isn't enough to motivate us. We need to uh, find something else outside of the actual physical job of of drawing something mental something psychological that's going to help us pu push us forward okay and what that is what i found it is is no matter what it is you do no matter what it is you do always aim to do your best so if you're being asked to do some crap i'll i'll i'll, I'll give you my own situation there was a point in my career where i was hired i was really broke i was really looking for work i was kind of making that transition between junior and intermediate artist and I was hired to do a job to work on a Dora the Explorer CD-ROM game <laughs> I know all of you are going oh my god what you know the horror uh, yeah and it was it, not only was it Dora which you know be it a good show for kids I kind of sort of guess very hard for a parent to listen to, for any parents out there, right? Because they yell everything. Hi, I'm Dora. This is a door. This is what we're doing. We're going to take a bike. Fucking, excuse my French, but you know what I mean? Enough of that shit. But I was doing it in Flash. And that to somebody like me, who was a classically trained artist, who dreamed of working for Disney, who, you know, spent his whole life drawing, doing Flash 2D Flash animation was a real kick in the, kick in the gut. You know, it wasn't something that I really particularly liked. So, number one, it's Dora. <laughs> number two, it's working using a technique that I could not stand. Furthermore, just to add insult to injury, it was in this, I had to drive all the way across town to this industrial area to work in this little studio that was this crammed little spot, and I couldn't for the life of me stand going driving to the spot oh yeah my first day on the job i got a ticket for speeding in a 30 kilometer an hour zone whatever anyways i digress but you see where i'm going with this i really there was really nothing driving me for the first few months working on this job the only thing keeping me going to work were my colleagues i loved my colleagues in fact it just so happened that years later 
one of my colleagues, one of the artists that worked there, ended up being the administrator at the animation department I taught at at the college, uh, Edith, who is to this day the most lovable human being I've ever met in my life and a real sweetheart. And, um, but that was it. The work itself, which I had to do nine to five, five days a week, was really sapping my energy, it was really sapping my drive. So for the first few months, it was really exhausting. But once I got past that, once I got past that hump, I realized at a certain point, if I'm going to maintain this job, if I'm going to keep doing this, I have to do, I have to find a sh shift in perspective. I decided I'm not just going to do my job to quote unquote, pay the bills. I'm going to do the best job I've ever done. I want a master flash. I wanted these animations to be amazing. I want this CD-ROM game to win awards. I want, I want to be, the reason why this this game does extremely well with my the work that I put into it. And it was a shift in perspective where all of a sudden it went from being somebody being dragged by the leash through the mud, being somebody who used this as an opportunity for me to get extremely good at something and to produce quality work. Regardless of the outcome, I didn't care. I wanted to do the best thing I could do. I started learning. I started, you know, getting to know the software a little bit better. I got more fluent in the software. I pushed my animations to, to the point where I was really happy. They were on model and they were really, they really were very entertaining and very uh, uh, fun to watch animations. And surely enough, I found the motivation to get up every day and go to work. It was the very act of just aiming to do my best, taking ownership over the quality, not the content, but the quality of what I was doing that motivated me. The second thing that I've found can really put you in the right headspace, the right perspective to motivate yourself is to think about the big picture. And this is something I've spoken about in the past with some of my earlier art talks. When you're just focusing on the moment, when you're thinking about the job that you have today and you don't like the job, then like, like this whole talk is about, it's very hard to find the energy and the drive to move forward. However, if you think about how you can approach this job in a way that's going to contribute to your future jobs. All of a sudden, you develop, you, 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 you develop the sense of purpose in your work that will, again, bring out the best quality in you and give you the drive to keep working, to keep focusing. Because when you're thinking about the big picture, when you're thinking about your career, all of a sudden you start to focus your skills towards those things that are going to get you hired in other places, like Blizzard, like you know Disney, like CD Projekt Red, or whatever the case might be. All of a sudden you think to yourself, okay, if I'm an animator, if my job is to be an animator, which that isn't my job right now, but if your job is to be an animator and you want to work for a big company, what are they going to be looking at? Are they going to be looking at the software you're using? Probably not, right? They're going to be looking at the quality of your animation. When you animate things, do they make me feel something? Do I feel entertained by it? Is the quality there? Do you know the techniques? Are you using all those little, those little professional techniques and getting, making that movement look fluid, giving it impact, giving it, giving a good sense of timing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you produce this work, even if you're doing something for Dora, for instance. The quality of your work is something that is going to catch the eye of future employers. It might not catch the eye of Disney, but it's going to catch the eye of your next employer who's looking for somebody who knows what they're doing, right? So that, again, can also contribute to your growth, to continue to contribute to the big picture, help you climb that ladder until eventually you get the job you're looking for. Third thing, and this actually steps, this actually takes us away from art in general, okay? And that is sometimes if your job is just to pay the bills, sometimes an art job is not the best pick. And actually, uh, I would go. I, re I recommend going and checking out uh, um, Bobby Chu, uh, checking out his YouTube channel because he has a talk where he actually covers the subject as well. He says something similar to this, and he's absolutely right about it. What he says is, if you're working an art job, an art job can sap your creative energy. Creative energy is a unique, think of, your, think of your energy gauges as different types of gauges. You have, you know, you have day-to-day -day mundane task meter, and then you have creative meter, and then you have financial meter, right? Your creative meter is a standalone meter, and it, and it, it requires specific energy, specific focus 
to deplete it. And that is doing creative work. If you're doing creative work that you don't like, what it does is it depletes your creative meter. But it's not contributing anything to, your, to the big picture. So what ends up happening is you work on this crappy art job that you don't like. And then you go home at the end of the day. And you don't have the drive to produce your own portfolio to get the job that you want. You, you, you just can't take drawing anymore. You don't have that drive in you anymore. So what you do instead is find a job you don't like. But to get you through that, focus on being great at it. Now, I'm not going to name names or anything like that. But I remember being at a grocery store about three years ago. And I met the cash. And the cashier who's behind the cash is an older guy. And for the, I knew I knew him from somewhere. Right? I said, I know that guy. I know that guy. And he was smiling and he has a sweet face and he just had this good energy about him. And everybody that went through the line just had this, just, you know, he made a point of making sure that everybody who went through the line had, you know, smiled at the end of it, which 99.5% of cashiers really don't give a crap about. They're there to do the job. They're getting paid minimum wage. And they focus on that minimum wage and that's what they give you. Minimum wage work. Right? But not him. He was like, he, 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 was, he looked like he was trying to win the Employee of the Year Award. He looked like he was trying to get a managerial job or a director job. The way he, the way he interacted with the customers. And I got, it came time that I came to the cash and I said, I know you from somewhere. I can't put my finger on it, but I know you from somewhere. And he goes, are you an artist? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I recognize you too, Adam. And I went, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I was your teacher. And I went, oh my God. This guy wasn't only my teacher. He was probably one of the best teachers I ever had in art. He was an absolutely phenomenal artist. But there he was working as a cashier at a grocery store. So I said, dude, I mean, you're 10 times the artist of anybody I've ever known. One of the best teachers I've ever known. Why are you here? And he goes, well, I wanted to pay for, I, he was trying to get a new, his car broke down and he didn't have enough money with his current job to pay for a car. So he decided to get this job. And he worked a side job. And I said, well, why here? Why don't you get it? Why don't you just freelance artists? He goes, no, because I want to save that energy for when I get home. And I went, smart guy. He got through the day, no matter what it is he was doing with a smile on his face. And he was a huge inspiration to me. Being it, being, he didn't only teach me how to be a professional in the classroom. He taught me how to be a professional standing in line at the grocery store. And that was probably a more valuable lesson than I learned anywhere else. No matter what it is, do your best. No matter what it is, aim to be awesome at it. And whatever it is you do, put that quality that only you can bring into it. Think about it. If Apple made shoes, if Apple computers made shoes, you know they would be amazing, right? You know they would be top quality. You know they would have Bluetooth and they would, you know, they would have Siri integrated into it. And they would, you know, there would be something amazing, something revolutionary, because that's what Apple represents. Even though shoes isn't something that they normally do, they work more in, you know, computers and that kind of thing. That's my point. No matter what it is you do, you have to put your, your name is your brand and you have to put that behind your work. Now, there's one last thing. And this isn't actually a way to motivate yourself. This is a way to get a, a good, solid perspective on what it is that you're, what's happening in your life. And that is the the being overworked side of things or being in a job that's demanding more of you than you have to give now remember something you're talking to a 41 year old man here at least at the time of this recording i've had my fair share share of jobs a lot of my jobs i'd say the majority of my jobs have been incredibly positive ones where i was working for incredibly supportive employers that respected people's time and their health and their families and never overworked them and you know got the best work out of people by respecting them and by by requesting the best of them and i have art talks on that as well so you can go check it out on my youtube channel as well okay there's other jobs that don't whether and, and salary has nothing to do about it whether they're whether they're you know they pay you you know whether they pay you a six-figure salary or whether they pay you peanuts is irrelevant what they demand of you what they ask of you is out of control I remember one job that I had of getting, you know, being a professional and here's a professional tip, never name names. <laughs> you never, you don't want that to come back and bite you in the ass. But I worked for this one particular company that required me to be away from my family for a long time, for long periods of time. And I had this job for a while. The studio was great. The work was great. The people I worked for, for were also great. 
But the demand of the job was more than I could provide. More than most people could provide. Unless you've got no life, no family, and eating isn't really your top priority. Or sleeping for that matter. When I first started the job, uh, you know, it was a pretty heavy workload. And I wasn't only doing my own job, but I was also doing the job of other people. Because they didn't compensate the others, so they expected me, being in more of a managerial position, to take, the, take that weight, to handle the weight for them. Which, in my personal opinion, was a very dumb management decision to make. You want to pay your artists well so that they produce good work and you have the, you have the power to be able to, you know, con to, to control the quality of the work. But if you don't pay them, then you end up taking what you get and that ends up causing stress on the studio and money for that matter. But I digress. But the, at the beginning, I thought, well, it's a learning curve. And when you start a new job, you might be stressed out. It might feel like heavy work because you haven't gotten to know the software yet. You haven't gotten to know how the system works, how, how, where to, how to save work, how to organize yourself, you know, what's what, where, who to talk to, that kind of idea. But after about two, three months, you should start getting your bearings, right? And you should start getting into the routine of working there and things should start lightening up. So at the beginning, when things were a little bit tight, it's perfectly cool. I'm used to it. I've been through it a thousand times. But after that three, four month mark, things just kept piling up and piling up and piling up. And at first I was going home at six o'clock and then I was going home at seven and then I was going home at eight and nine. And you can start to see a pattern. I wasn't having dinner till 10 o'clock at night and I'd go to bed at 11 and then I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning because I had to be at the office the next day at 630 in the morning because it was a, a, almost an hour and a half drive to get there. And I'd be at the studio all day and then I'd, everybody would leave. And when I would leave, I would be the last one leaving. It was nine o'clock at night and the custodian was walking around. He was, he, was, he was walking around with the vacuum. And I did this night after night after night after night. My health started to suffer. My sleep started to suffer. My, my, my emotional state started to suffer. My productivity started to plummet. I started to get discouraged. I started to get stressed and depressed. And they just kept piling it up. Thankfully, I had been in a situation where I had not only experienced the being on the brink of an emotional and physical and chemical burnout from, from overwork, but I'd also witnessed people in my life who had also experienced burnouts that I saw had spent years of their life getting over it. And sometimes you never do. Because I've seen that when, you're, when your stress level overwhelms you, when your adrenal glands are overwhelmed and you're not getting enough sleep and you're not healing and your brain isn't healing and your body isn't healing, your adrenal lines, glands go, then your endocrine system starts to suffer and your thyroid goes on you or your brain starts to go on you and then your muscles start to suffer and then you, st then you end up getting auto autoimmune disease and so on and so forth, okay? It's a trickle-down effect that becomes very physical, very permanent and can kill you quite early and quite painfully. So take my word for that. And I witnessed this in my life. So when I started to see that I was starting to get overwhelmed, that my memory was starting to go, that I was starting to get insomnia, that I was starting to constantly obsess and stress over my work and nothing else existed, I realized it was time for me to put my foot down. And I had been in the studio for about six months at that point. So one day I'm sitting down at my desk and I said, it's six o'clock, looks like a reasonable time to go home. I close my computer. I put my coat on, I put my bag over my shoulder, and I started walking for the door. My boss, who, by the way, was an awesome guy, if you're listening to this talk, I love you, <laughs> but he was in a tough position too, okay, because the deadlines for this particular project were insane, were insane and the workload was insane. He, 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 he sticks his head out of his cubicle and goes, where are you going, Adam? And I said, I'm going home. I, I, it's 6 o'clock, and I'm gonna be, I'm, if I leave now, I'll have dinner at 7.30, so I think it's a good idea for me to, to eat and get some rest. And he looks at me and he says, are you finished your work? I said, dude, if I stay and finish my work, I won't, be going, I won't go home until 5 o'clock in the morning. And I said, I've been doing this for a long time. It's time for me to, go. It's time for me to take care of myself because I'm starting to really suffer for it. And he looks at me and he goes, it's your choice. And I knew what he meant by that. It meant that I probably wouldn't have a job the next day. And I said, yeah, I know it's my choice. And it was a, it's, 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 I know it's not an easy choice to make, but I'm going home to have dinner. And, and he said, all right, I understand. I'll see you tomorrow then. And I said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And I went home, or at least I went to the place I was staying at, and I had my dinner, and I got a good night's rest. And instead of being incredibly stressed out about the fact that I'm about to get sacked, instead, I was incredibly relieved about the fact that, number one, I wouldn't have to, you know, drive three hours back and forth between cities. I, would see, I wouldn't be seeing my family only one and a half days a week. And remember, I've got three kids, and one of them was a baby at the time. 
right? A, a very young baby, which was incredibly difficult on me and my wife and everybody. And I said, and, and I started to fantasize about the idea of going home and telling my, my wife and my kids, I'm home and I'm staying home. And I had that thought in my head. And the next day I show up at work and they said, and, and sure enough, 3 p.m. comes and they said, they said, uh, you know, they, they, they called me down to the conference room and I sat down with my direct, my direct supervisor and the head of the company and, and they said, listen, you know, we really like you. We think you're a great guy, but, you know, unfortunately we don't feel that you fit into the company culture, which is the equivalent of saying you're not willing to do what we're asking you to do, right? Or your work isn't good enough, whatever the case might be. I think it was a bit of both maybe because at that point my work did really start to suffer. And... And, I, and they expected me to go, oh, what? Um, oh, God. Sorry, it's windy here. But uh, they expected me to kind of get upset and everything. And I looked, I, I looked at, I looked at the, the head of the company. I looked at her and I said, listen, I said, I couldn't agree with you more. I do not feel that I'm a good fit for this company, which was my way of saying I'm not willing to, to work under those conditions. Right. But it was done diplomatically. And I had a big authentic smile on my face. I looked at her and I said, I totally get you. You're absolutely right about that. And I said, I said, I really do agree. I don't really feel I'm a good, I'm a good fit for this company. I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to do a better job. And my direct supervisor, God love this guy, such an authentically good guy, was so torn up about the fact that this decision had to be made, right? Because they were working for a huge client that they couldn't afford to lose. And what I was doing was, was going to cost them dearly, right? And I said, and he looked like he almost was about to break into tears. And I looked at her and I said, and this guy over here, not naming names, right? I said, this is, he, I said, this guy's holding the whole company, holding the whole department together. And I said, I've never had more pleasure working for somebody than him. I said, he's a gem. I said, I'm, I'm sorry I let the guy down, but he's a gem. And I said, you're really lucky to have this guy. And it's been an honor to work for him. And she looked at me and she says, oh yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And he got emotional over that. And I, I looked at him and I thanked him really sincerely for it. And I walked out. And I said bye. It was a very friendly goodbye. I grabbed my stuff and I, and I had a huge smile on my face the whole time I was in the car driving home. And when I came home, I told my wife and I told my kids that I was staying home. And everybody cried and had a good, good happy cry over it. And that was it. Sometimes it's not your motivation. Sometimes the company is just burning you out. And this is an important lesson for you to learn. If and when you do burn out, if a company does expect their, their employees to, to, to deliver regardless of what that does physically or chemically or emotional to their employee, I guarantee you they will give this many fucks when you do burn out. You, you think, you might think that being loyal to a company is going to increase your longevity with that company, it's going to increase, it's going to make you more employable. Yes, it will, but burning yourself out won't. And I have, like I said, I've seen people emotionally burn out and I swear to you, they gave everything they had under the most incredible circumstances to that company. Now I really mean burning themselves out, seriously burning themselves out, working under insane, under, under insane circumstances. They burnt themselves out for that company and within 24 hours they were replaced and forgotten and that was that they gave their health potentially for the rest of their life they sacrificed their health and the quality of their life potentially forever for years at least years they're never going to get back or for life if something seriously ha serious happened and that company just discarded them like an old computer and got an upgrade to a new one end of story loyalty goes to those who are loyal to you if you're going to give your love, if you're going to give your time and your energy to a company, it's because they give their love and their energy and their time to you. And as I've, t I've spoken about in past art talks before, um, when, a, when, when you have an employer, like I've had in the past, who looked at me and said, you look like you're going through a bit of a hard time, buddy. Why don't you take the next two, three months off paid? When somebody does that to you, you take a week off. And when you come back after that week, you are willing to sell your left nut to make him happy, right? When somebody tries to burn you out, if somebody doesn't have any, it expects you to stay there till 9, 10 o'clock at night and not see your family five days a week, well, they didn't expect me not to spend, I was my choice to work there, but if they expect that kind of time out of you and don't give a crap about your health, 
let them go. Find another job and let them go. Goodbye. Because you owe them zero loyalty at all. A paycheck is never worth it. Why? They're going to pay you a good salary. They burn you out. And what happens after that? Give yourself a couple of months. That money's gone. Then what? It's gone. Right? I've, I've seen it all. So number one, find your own motiv- motivation. Find your own drive to move forward. Number two, think about the big picture. Where are you going with this? What can I do today that's going to get me where I want to get to tomorrow? Number three, work in a healthy manner. And if a company's trying to burn you out, you owe them nothing. You never owe anybody your life. You never owe anybody your health. You never need to sacrifice anything in your life to make a company happy. I don't give a shit how much they pay you for it. All right. So hopefully this art talk uh, was enjoyable. I hope you learned something from this. I hope it helps get you through and I wanted to give out a special thanks to all of you in the YouTube community because I've gotten a lot of feedback lately from people from from people inquiring about the school or whatever the case might be or people just watching my YouTube videos authentically saying I love what you're doing and keep doing it and to you guys I say I love you back you've guys you guys have been hugely supportive I mean little to no trolls on my channel whatsoever which I should be blessed for and I just get every day I get this wonderful encouragement and you wonder why I keep making these art talks I make them because of that I make them because I know that it's making a difference I know that I'm having an impact on your life and you have an impact on me as well when you come back with this wonderful feedback all right so don't forget to like and subscribe if you uh, are interested in my lucid pixel mentorship I'm gonna mention something important I am booked until about mid-november early December but when you sign up you get immediate access to the material, or at least the material that's paid for. But all the details you can find on my website, which is linked in the description below. And don't forget about the Brush Sauce Theater Art Contest with myself and Tyler Edlin. There's a whole community on Google+, Plus, huge artists and damn talented artists. And you get free critique, free critique and, uh, and free exposure on your work. Uh, it's just for fun, you know. This is this is not employment work, but this will definitely help you towards your towards your employment and gives you a good excuse to get out and get some really good work done. All right, nobody's profiting it, profiting from it but yourself. All right. So hopefully you enjoyed, and I will see you soon. Take care.